Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, That Model Railway Guy, and welcome to a long overdue update from the Modular Model Railway. I know a lot of you have been very patiently waiting for another one of these updates, and hopefully by the end of today's video you'll see just why it's taken me quite so long to put this together. But if you hadn't already guessed, today's episode is mostly going to focus on working semaphore signals. Now, having signals on a layout that actually operate is nothing particularly new. People have been doing it for a while, but certainly in my experience, I would say it's one of the more challenging things to include on a layout. There's a few different ways of going about this. If you're a more experienced modeler, then the most popular way seems to be building up very delicate brass kits. Unfortunately, I don't really have the skill set for that. So at the complete opposite end of the spectrum, we have the DAPL ready-made signals. And these come fully assembled, fully painted with a motor installed. You just plonk them down on your layout, wire them up and away you go. I stayed away from the DAPL signals for a few different reasons. Firstly, the price. Um, they're not massively expensive individually. Uh, they're, of course, a little bit more than a normal signal. But if you need several of them for a layout like I do, uh, then that price quite quickly stacks up. Also, I'd heard mixed things about them. Uh, some people love them. Other people had had problems with them, either getting them to work reliably or just even getting them to work at all. And so I sort of figured that I didn't want to spend that amount of money on a product I wasn't completely confident in. Truth be told though, the main reason I decided not to go with them is simply because at the time I was looking, they didn't have enough of the type of signals I was looking for available. They've got loads of GWR signals, which is fantastic if you're a GWR modeler, uh, but I really wanted LMS signals for the layout. Now, the modular layout isn't meant to be set anywhere in particular, it's supposed to be quite generic, and so I felt the LMS signal style was the best fit for this, especially with that kind of being what British Railways adopted as well. So yeah, it makes it the most generic. As far as I can tell though, DAPL at the moment only make a standard home signal and a distance signal. I think they do have some plans to do bracket signals in the future, but I wasn't really willing to wait around for those, and seeing as I wanted a bit more customization with the signals I was going to have, really I decided it would be better to go for something else. And in the end, that was the Ratio LMS Signals Kit. Now, this is a plastic kit. I've built plastic kits in the past, but nothing quite as small or delicate as this, so I wasn't entirely sure what I was in for. But within each kit, you can build up several signals, and they're quite reasonably priced too. So I figured that if it did all go horribly wrong, at least I hadn't wasted a huge amount of money. By the way, if you're interested in these kits, then do check out the link I put down in the description below where you can get them for yourself. And they do a whole range of signals, not just LMS ones. So yeah, the ratio kits are definitely one to check out if you're interested in adding signals to your own layout. I will say though that they are kind of tricky to build. Uh, it took me a couple of weeks to do this and I did it off camera because I just don't think I would have been able to cope if I'd have been trying to film it at the same time. So let's head over to the modular layout now and we'll take a look at the finished signals before we get around to installing them on the layout. So these are the signals I've built and they were all made up using the Ratio LMS Signals Kit. Painting the arms was a pretty time consuming process in itself and then drilling out the spectacles too so I could fit coloured lenses was a bit of a nightmare. Putting the actual kits together was a bit better but still quite fiddly, especially as I wanted these to work, so all in all it was a good decision to do this section off camera. To give you a quick rundown of the signals I've made, first up we have some standard home signals. I generally built these first as they were the most simple to put together being just a single post. There's three of these in total, but there is also a fourth which includes a shunt signal. That does also move, which I'm very pleased about, and getting the wires to operate properly was a bit of a faff, but I did get there in the end. Finally, we have this bracket signal, which will be placed just outside the station, so trains know whether they're going into platform one or platform two. Again, this was a more complicated build than the standard home signals, but being a little bit bigger made it slightly easier to handle. As I mentioned a moment ago, I drilled out and fitted coloured spectacles to each signal, and the reason for this is because I've actually managed to fit a tiny LED light into the moulded lamps on each of the signal posts. Just like in real life, the light shines through each of the colours, red for stop and then blue for go, which when paired with a warm yellowish light makes it appear green. The wires for these then just run down the back of each of the signal posts, as you can see here on this one I haven't gotten round to painting yet. The rest of them are covered in white though, which does hide them fairly well. 
They're not completely invisible, but you'll have to be looking really closely to see them. So, those are all the signals, and now let's fit them to the layout and get them working. So before I install the signals, I will just quickly show you a few small things I've done on the layout since the previous update. Firstly, you may notice I've painted the sides of all the rails on the two station modules. I've shown this plenty of times in previous videos, so I didn't think I needed to cover it again specifically. Something else I've added as well is point rodding. This is mostly made up from the Wills point rodding kit and a few scratch built pieces as well. The kit is definitely very fiddly to put together, but that's kind of the theme for this episode, I guess. I'm pretty sure it's not completely accurate, so for anyone who does know their stuff when it comes to signalling, I sincerely apologise. <laughs> really, it's just meant to be a general impression of the point rodding. It's a nice little detail that I think adds a bit of interest. You can see I've also tried to include the facing point locks as well. They're not on every point the passenger trains would pass over, but I've tried my best to add them where I can. One bit that was particularly hard to do was the long section that runs all the way along the bottom of Platform 1 to the points at the far end of the loop. Now, this kit comes in moulded grey plastic, but I have weathered it slightly by adding a brown wash over the top, and I've left this section here unpainted so you can see briefly what it looked like originally. To add a layer of dirt and grime to this though, I'm going to use a Citadel paint called Seraphim Sepia. And like I said, this is a wash, so it'll run into all the nooks and crannies and highlight all the lovely moulded detail. As you can see, when I start adding it to the point rodding, it looks a bit much at first, but generally as it spreads out and runs away, it becomes a much more subtle effect. And I do also dab away some of the excess too, if I feel like there's a bit too much on there. Basically, the wash just gives the point rodding a more matte finish, so that the shiny plastic material is less obvious. And of course, using brown as well just gives a rough representation of dirt and grime that's built up over the years. I may well go back and do some extra weathering once I've got the ballast in place, but for now I think it's looking pretty good, so let's get on with installing the signals. I'm going to kick things off by installing the starter at this end of the platform, since I think it'll be the easiest to get working. The first thing I do is drill a hole so that the operating wire can pass through the board. It doesn't need to be too big, as the wire will literally just be going up and down, and the base for these signal posts is quite small anyway. With that done, I'll just test the position of the signal to make sure I'm happy, and also check that the operating wire and the LED wires both go through the hole. And now I've added some super glue to the base so I can fix this down into position. This is where we get to the tricky part though, which is actually making the signal work. This is pretty much the same technique I used to motorise the points, so if you haven't seen that video it might be worth checking that one out too. First I bent the wire from the signal to a 90 degree angle so that it can hook into the servo motor. I'm using the same aluminium channel as I did before to hold the motors in place, and now I'm drilling pilot holes so that I can attach it to the underside of the baseboard. And with the pilot holes drilled, I can now fix the bracket in place using a screw at each end. The servo motor gets pushed back into position, and then I took the arm and threaded the wire through this before attaching it back to the rest of the servo. The signal is connected up to the motor, so now we just need to program it, and again I'm going to be using the Megapoint system. With the servo motor plugged in, it's just a case of selecting the correct channel, and then I can set the high and low levels for the signal. So first I'll set the danger position, and then the clear position. With programming complete, let's test it out, and you can see I've added some new switches to my temporary control panel for this too. With the flick of a switch, the signal jumps into life as I set it to clear. And then we'll get it to return to danger too. Now this system does have a bounce simulation as well, so you can see the slack being taken up as the signal arm is raised. When it returns to danger, it does also bounce too, which you can see a little bit, but I need to do some fine tuning to get this to show properly. But it's a nice little detail to include. So, one signal down, nine more to go. I'll get on with that now, and I'll see you in a bit. So, it's taken a little bit of time. 
I say a little bit of time, it's taken quite a lot of time actually. But the rest of the signals are finally installed. You might be able to see a couple of them dotted around here. You've already seen the two at the far end of the station, but now let's take a close up look at the rest. So first up, you've already seen the platform one starter signal I installed a moment ago, and now I've added a second starter to control platform two. Similarly, we have two more starters at the other end of the station, which allows me to use both platforms in either direction. The one on platform one is also a standard single post starter, and there was just enough space to fit this in at the end of the ramp. The one for platform two has the main starter, but it's also the one with the shunt signal on too. Believe it or not, I did manage to get that working as demonstrated here, and this controls access to the sidings that come off of platform two. Then the last two major signals are here, just a little bit further up the line. This bracket signal has two arms to let trains know which platform they're coming into. The higher one on the left is for the main line on platform one, while the slightly shorter one on the right is for the diverging route into platform two. Flushed with success, I then decided to make up some ground signals for the sidings. Now these do come included in the ratio kit, which is a nice addition, and I was always intending to add them as static signals, seeing as the sidings are right at the front of the layout. But at this point, I was feeling a little bit cocky, and so I thought I'd have a go at motorizing these as well. And with some serious customization and lots of trial and error, I've just about managed it. Amazingly, I was also able to squeeze in an LED too, so just like the rest of the signals, these will eventually light up for nighttime running. So yeah, I'm really pleased with how this has turned out, and it was definitely a challenge, a fun challenge nevertheless, but I'm certainly not in the mood to repeat this anytime soon. One thing I will say I haven't done yet though, is I haven't wired up any of the LEDs that are inside all of the signals, and that is because I'm gonna do all of the lighting for these two modules at the same time. So things like the signals, the buildings, I've got some other cool ideas for things I want to include as well. So yeah, I'll probably do a whole video on that sometime in the future, so keep your eyes open for that. Now though that the signals are installed and all the point rodding is in place as well, I can finally get on to ballasting the track, which is another big job that needs doing and one that I think is going to make another big difference. So, there's no time like the present, let's get on with it, shall we? Now you've seen me ballast track in plenty of previous videos, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail again here, but I did want to at least show you the process as it's a pretty major step forward. Of course, the main challenge this time was that I needed to do not just one, but two modules. These two sections also have the most track as well, with this one being mostly doubled for the platforms, and the other having lots of extra sidings too. The process is pretty much the same though, it just takes a bit longer. I was also careful not to cover up the point rodding too much either. Of course, I want it to be held in place by the ballast to make it stronger, but I still want to be able to see it since I spent so much time putting it together. With all the ballast in position on this board, I then gave it a misting of water, which I found really helped stop the glue from balling up into little droplets. As always, I'm using a standard mix of water, PVA and washing up liquid, and it's applied to the layout using a syringe. Having the platforms on either side of the track was actually really helpful as it made it easy to flood large areas at a time and just allow the glue to seep in everywhere. And with the six foot between the two lines covered, I then moved on to adding the glue between the rails. see with the point rodding it was fine to put the glue around it although I tried to avoid getting it on the side of the platforms and really it was just a case of repeating this until the glue was covering the whole area so with the glue down on all the ballast we can leave this module to dry and move on to the next one on this module I started out with ballasting the main line first I'm also avoiding putting it too near the signal posts at the moment as I don't want to gum up the mechanism with glue. As you can see, I then moved on to the first of the two sidings on the right. 
I do have a slightly different plan for the second siding though, as I want this to have a more overgrown and out of use feel. For this, I made up a slightly different ballast using a mixture of a few different products. First up, I started with Pico's Ash and Cinders. This is very fine and is intended for use around engine sheds, which is why it has this black colour. Next up, I mixed in some Gauge Master Ballast, which has a slightly darker grey colour than what I usually use. And finally, I added in a small amount of the Woodland Scenics Medium Grey, which is what I've used on the rest of the layout. And this was all then mixed together to create a much more random and messy looking ballast. You can see it going down here, and the difference between the two sidings is quite noticeable. Now eventually my plan is to have these sidings grassed over a bit too, to give them a really weathered effect. For the one with the darker ballast, I really want it to be a siding that's rarely used, which is why it's not very well maintained. In true Heritage Railway spirit, I'll probably fill it with a few old wagons and maybe part of a loco just quietly rusting away. And you can see I'm also sprinkling parts of this messy ballast over the other siding as well, just to blend it together. Moving on though, with all the ballast down, it was once again time to get the glue out. You may notice I'm avoiding the points at the moment, and that's because I'll be ballasting these separately so that I don't accidentally glue them together. I'll be showing this in more detail in an upcoming video though, so if you're wondering how to ballast points, you'll get to find out very soon. And as I start putting down the last little bits of glue here, the second module has all of the ballast in place, so we'll leave it to dry overnight, and fingers crossed, everything will still work in the morning. So the ballast has now had plenty of time to dry, and it's nice and solid. I've got the two station modules back together, and you can see I've also given the rest of the boards a coat of brown paint, as a base layer for the scenery to go on top of later. I've given the tops of the rail a good clean too to remove any excess glue, so I think it's time we check all the track and have a bit of fun using the signals in a practical setting too. As you can see, the ballast hasn't affected the running of these modules at all, and it's really good to see the scenery take another step forward. I'm also really pleased with the working semaphore signals too, and to me, this really brings the layout to life. I have had to make some compromises with the signaling, which I'm sure wouldn't happen in reality, so if you're someone who does know a lot about signaling, then please do try to forgive me. My excuse though is that it's a heritage railway, they don't necessarily have all the correct signals, but they make do with what they've got. And working signals was something I knew I wanted on the layout from the very beginning. I realised it was going to be challenging though, and I've definitely been putting it off, but that said, it's great to see it all working now. I actually got a second Megapoint servo controller for this, so there's now one of those on each module, which does open up some interesting possibilities for the future too. That said, annoyingly, I did get a faulty board initially, which wasn't talking to the control panel properly. I had to send it back for repairs in the end, but thankfully it did all get sorted, and now everything is working very well indeed. In fact, in the future, I could have someone working as a dedicated signalman to operate the points and signals while the locos are controlled by someone else, so that might be a fun experiment to try at some point in the future. For now though, that's going to be it, so if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon as well to see more updates from the modular layout. In the meantime though, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!